Welcome back to Cinema Wellman. I am your host, David, and it's time for, well, another month has ended, so it's time for the top 10 and the bottom five, and we do that every month here at Cinema Wellman, trying to highlight some of the best and the worst that we've, uh, you know, kind of exposed ourselves to here over the previous month. Now, January was a very busy month here at Cinema Wellman as we screened, admittedly, an awful lot of movies. A couple reasons for that. One reason is that the Academy Award nominations came out this month, a couple weeks ago, last week, I think it was. Uh, Time is a blur. Um, And that means that we're currently on our annual treasure hunt where we try to locate and watch as many of the uh, nominees from the, this year, 54 films that were nominated in all categories. Now, the other reason why we screen so many movies is a a crippling... (laughs) insomnia that has invaded Cinema Wellman. So in any event, it gave us an awful lot to choose from uh, when compiling this monthly list. Now, you may notice if you look on the blog, um, you notice that I always put a, a table that has all of the films screened. And if you look at that, you'll notice that I did watch a lot of the uh, of this year's nominees. None of them were eligible for this list um, because I'm going to deal with them in a later episode. Okay, so we're going to start as we usually do, which is at the bottom, and there's a lot of bottom uh, to choose from in this month. So I promise that it gets better after these loathsome five. I promise, because they're pretty bad. All right, bottom five. Number five from 1975, Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS. Now, the warning on the poster sums it up rather nicely. The poster reads, some members of the public may find certain scenes in this film offensive and shocking. Some members of the public, certain scenes, this was disgusting from the start. Um, I actually thought I was in for a campy sexploitation slash Nazi exploitation. that is a genre movie, but what I got was far worse than anything that I've ever seen in either of those genres. This was, you know, the, the list of adjectives is long distasteful, it was gross, it was horrible. Um, yeah, and it was offensive, and it was shocking. I, I should have listened to the poster. Uh this trash only took nine days to film, and when you watch it, don't watch it. Uh, if you were to see it, it looked like it took two days to film. Um, I tried to look past the gratuitous nudity and the b- really brutal, bloody torture scenes to concentrate on the fact that it was filmed on the set of the 60s concentration camp comedy, Hogan's Heroes. I wish I was like Schultz from that show and saw nothing. Um, you may wonder how anything could possibly be worse than that. How is this only the fifth worst film that we watched here in January? Well, I'll do my best to explain as we continue to sift through January's burning dumpster of dreck. Number four from 1973 is Turkish Delight. Nothing delightful about this at all. Um, director Paul Verhoeven is the person we can thank slash blame for such cinematic horseshit as, uh, Starship Troopers and Showgirls. He also is responsible from what I call decent trash, like RoboCop, the original Total Recall, and Basic Instinct. Uh, Turkish Delight was worse than anything he's ever created, and that's saying a lot. Uh, Rutger Hauer plays Eric, a protagonist that you despise for the entirety of the film. Um, I've written about how annoying that is, and I've spoken about that in these episodes on more than a few occasions. Uh, Eric has zero redeeming qualities and is a despicable creep from the very start. Uh, I hated the protagonist, so I hated this film. That usually happens. They tend to go hand in hand. Um, It actually happens two more times on this list. Um, The only reason I screened this was because it was nominated for a Best Foreign Language Film Oscar. It came from the Netherlands. And I will remember this, Netherlands, uh, the next time the Cinema Wellman World Cup comes around, uh, this is going to hurt you. I have a long memory. Number three in the bottom five is uh, from 1988. It's the unbearable lightness of being. Um, I usually enjoy movies featuring Daniel Day-Lewis. I think he's a tremendously talented actor. Um, That method acting goes a little far, but whatever, do your craft. Um, He can create mesmerizing, unforgettable characters. Three-time Oscar winner, a big fan of several of his movies, Last of the Mohicans, Gangs of New York, There Will Be Blood, and Lincoln. Excellent films featuring great performances by Day-Lewis. This film... The unbearable lightness of being, well, they got the unbearable part right. It's almost three hours of his character, Tomas, uh, pretentious, instructing various women to, quote, take off your clothes. That's all it, and they all do it. 
That's all it took. It must be easy being Daniel Day-Lewis. You must have a lot of friends. Um, I guess it happens when you look like him, but it shouldn't, doesn't mean it should be the basis of a movie. This was boring. This was so pretentiously boring. Brings us to number two from 1998. Uh, it's titled The Idiots, and um, this offensive garbage comes to us from director Lars von Trier, and it's part of the Dogme, uh, Dogma, Dogme, what, however they want to pronounce it, 95 style of filmmaking. That's technically interesting. They they don't they all they only use natural lighting. There's all sorts of technical things that make it look different, and uh, it also results in a, oddities in film. Um, this Danish film centers on a group of people who find it funny to go out in public and act like they are intellectually disabled to see how others react. Yeah. It's as bad as it sounds. The only reason I watch this is because it's one of the few remaining films left on my cult movie list. Um, whoever enjoyed this belongs to a cult that I want no part of. This was offensive and uh, insensitive. Uh, I stand with English film critic Mark Kermode, who was tossed out of a screening at the Cannes Film Festival and he, because he stood up and shouted, Il est merde! Il est merde indeed! This was total... Merd. Good on you, Mark Kermode. Uh, and number one, so we've got Nazis torturing, and we've got that, and we've got people acting as if they're intellectually disabled for laughs, um, and and you have uh, other uh, other things that are violations of my senses, at least. What could be the worst? Well, let's go to 1997 and take a look at, don't please, uh, In the Company of Men. Uh, so, I'm going to let IMDb explain it. Two business executives, one an avowed misogynist, the other emotionally wounded by his love interest, set out to exact revenge on the female gender by seeking out the most innocent, uncorrupted girl they can find and ruining her life. End quote. Yeah, that's the premise of this film. Um, while I was watching it, I, I was hoping that everyone that was associated with this film would just spontaneously combust and die wherever they were. Um, oh, and the uncorrupted girl is deaf, and they make fun of that as well, and they use the R word. This is just an appalling, unwatchable piece of garbage. Uh, just terrible, 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 terrible. Um, ugh, I'm glad the top five is over. They were really bad this month. Some some months it's like, well, that was kind of funny, but that's not really that good. Um, or it offends me for one reason or another, but eh, these were above and beyond. So let's uh, kind of reset. Maybe you have time for a quick shower to wash that slime off. And then we'll talk about the good stuff. So the good stuff starts it, with 1992's Light Sleeper. Um, director Paul Schrader has a history of making interesting character-driven films. Um, Blue Collar, Hardcore, which is tremendous. Uh, George C. Scott uh, as a, a, a dad looking for his daughter in the adult film industry in just sleazy L.A. Uh, Patty Hearst was very good. Affliction was excellent. And Autofocus, uh, which is about um, Bob Crane, who was the star of Hogan's Heroes that was actually mentioned earlier. Um, these are all prime examples of, of good work that Schrader has done over the years. And and Willem Dafoe is the star, and he is he's not just another pretty face. Um, I think he's an excellent actor who's actually underrated. If it's possible for someone who's been nominated for four Oscars to be underrated, I think uh, Willem Dafoe is. Skip that Green Goblin nonsense. Um, check out uh, To Live and Die in L.A., Platoon, Shadow of the Vampire, the Florida Project, which I loved, and The Lighthouse. And he also made autofocus with Schrader. So put Schrader and Defoe together and you have something worth watching. Light Sleeper is a slow burn atmospheric crime drama in which drug dealer Defoe reconsiders his whole line of work and his life in general. Um, it was watched because it was on the cult movie list and they finally got one right. Those are hit or miss, which I guess actually fits the entire category. Number nine on the top ten for January is from 1976, and it's a short, and it's titled Molly's Pilgrim. Um, my contempt for the Academy was documented in a recent episode, and they continue to annoy me on a regular basis. That being said, this short film makes me happy that I set a goal to see everything that was ever nominated in any Academy Award category. If I didn't set that goal and make that list, I would never have gotten to see 
Molly's Pilgrim. This Oscar-winning short film is about a young Russian Jewish girl who emigrates to America with her family to escape religious persecution. Um, most of the film takes place at Molly's school right before Thanksgiving. Her school's going through the usual Thanksgiving bullshit myth, as all schools do. Uh, that and the Columbus nonsense is frustrating. My students knew exactly where I stood with that Euro trash. You track down any one of my students that I've ever taught. Hey, what did Mr. D think about Columbus? They will give you an earful. In any event, Molly's Pilgrim, uh, she makes a Pilgrim doll as part of this Thanksgiving project, and her doll does not look like all the other dolls that the kids make, and for a very good reason. And she ends up schooling her classmates and her teacher uh, with a lesson that'll bring tears to your eyes. You go, Molly. That was excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Nice little film. Number eight is from 2001, and it's titled The Experiment. Um, the cult movie books come through again with this one. This is the disturbing German film. Is there any other kind? Uh, the Experiment in, in the title um, is set to take place over two weeks, and it features 20 men who are hired to play prisoners and guards in a prison. Ten are going to be prisoners, ten are going to be guards. And it goes about as well as you'd expect it to. Let's just say that it doesn't take long for things to deteriorate. This is an interesting and disturbing look at human nature and what a little power can do to change who you are. It was a wild ride. Now, speaking of wild rides, let's look at number seven from 1985, Drunken Dragon. Now, several years ago, I decided that my milestone movies, number 5,000, 6,000, etc., overall, uh, were they were all going to be kung fu slash wuxia films. And I decided to do this to honor a college roommate of mine who had passed away. He and I spent countless hours in altered states watching these cinematic treats on Saturday afternoons. And to, with help, uh, to, I needed help picking the title, so I enlisted another college friend of mine who was right there in that little roach palace on Aberdeen Street in Boston. Um, and I have him help me choose those milestone films. He helped me choose number 5,000, which was Mad Monkey Kung Fu. And he's been on board with me ever since. And I mention this because Drunken Dragon was all-time film number 8,000, and it did not disappoint. Um, the story is pretty much the same as many of these films, but the story's not the draw when it comes to Kung Fu films, Wuxia films, uh, wire foo films, uh, that genre name is because uh, a lot of these people fly, and that's uh, referring to the wires that they have on. Um, I, all I know is that there's always a lot of tension between these rival kung fu schools and styles. Your panther style is no good. I, my cobra style is better. It's, it's just fantastic. Now, the draw here, among other things, is a, a guy fighting two enemies while sitting in a rowboat. The rowboat's just on the floor. There's no water at all. It's a man sitting in a rowboat, and he fights two guys. One of the guys that he's fighting has a rocket attached to his head. Um, at one point, he and his buddy, he lays down on top of his buddy who's in a cart, and he fires off the rocket, and they shoot themselves towards the guy in the rowboat. This is just good stuff. I never get tired of it. Um, and it's good once every thousand movies. Uh, to just watch one of those and kind of cleanse the palate. Um, special thanks to the old Channel 56 in Boston for making our sat Saturday afternoon so memorable back in the day. Um, let's go to number six from 2003. It's Gozu. Um, one of the biggest compliments I can pay a movie after seeing over 8,000 of them is, I've never seen that before. And uh, that compliment means that someone out there is doing something unique and original. At least they're trying. It doesn't always mean it's really good. Um, it doesn't always mean that it's pleasant to watch. Now, I really like this movie, but I'm going to tell you about a, a sequence in a couple minutes in a minute that was kind of disturbing. Um, director uh, Takashi Miike's crime drama slash horror hybrid definitely fits into that I've never seen this before category. This is a mind-bending mind -bending film that's got a lot of surrealistic uh, elements to it, and it's about a Yakuza enforcer who is ordered to drive his brother to be whacked. Um, when the target accidentally dies en route, the trouble begins. When the body mysteriously disappears, the trouble intensifies. In one of the most bizarre sequences I have ever seen, a petite young woman 
graphically gives birth to a full-grown adult male. Not see that every day. That was Gozu, and it still rattles me. <laughs> interesting, interesting stuff. Let's go on to number five from 1987. It's titled Pathfinder. Um, this was such an unexpected treat. Uh, nominated for Best Foreign Language Film in 1988, this Norwegian adventure takes place around 1000 CE, that's the old AD, uh, and follows a young Sami man who witnesses a band of vicious raiders murder his family. He flees to a nearby village for help, but they are, of course, reluctant to bring him in. He's an outsider. They don't trust him. Um, this has great action sequences. Uh, it highlights the story that's a coming-of-age story in a time when life was brutal and unforgiving. The bad guys in this, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's the Judes, T-J-U-D-E-S, are really bad dudes. They are not to be trifled with. And it's interesting watching an action film that has no guns because you, you we're so used to, all right, he or she's going to reload that clip. The bad guys are going to come around the corner, and here we go. There's going to be a spray of bullets and everything. These people have arrows, bows and arrows, and knives and clubs and stuff like that. It, it's wild. The uh, the outdoor sequence, well, the whole thing is outdoors. Some of the um, cinematography is just stunning uh, in the in the cold temperatures, and you just you're just chilly watching it. That's Pathfinder from 1987. Number four is from 1996, and it's Fly Away Home. Now, I have never tried to hide my emotions while watching movies. I was once caught crying during Ice Age by my daughter, who teased me about it. I mean, she was nine at the time. <laughs> I bring this up because I was very weepy during Fly Away Home. Oscar nominated for Caleb Deschanel's excellent cinematography. It tells the story of a young girl and her dad, mom dies in a car crash, of course, who attempt to lead a flock of orphaned Canadian geese south by air. I know the metaphor is a little heavy-handed there, but I loved this. 14-year-old Anna Paquin is wonderful as the young girl, determined to save these geese and lead them on their migratory way. It's a tad on the sappy side, but sometimes sappy hits the spot. This is worth a watch, especially if you're a bird person. I know Canadian geese, I know their poop is nasty and gross and it's everywhere, but they're pretty cool. You're definitely rooting for success in this one. Let's go to number three on the top 10 for January. It's from last year, 2022, and it's titled The Pale Blue Eye. Now, I am a card-carrying Edgar Allan Poe geek. When I was teaching, my gothic horror Poe unit lasted over a month and was always a student favorite. I took great pleasure in introducing kids to Poe and watching their reactions as I read some of their more gruesome tales to them. Kids love stuff like that. If you didn't know that, you should know that. The bloodier, the better. They love it. They eat it up. And watching them cringe while reading the he buried the axe in her brain line from the black cat was always one of the highlights of my year. Uh, I'm also a big Christian Bale fan, as you'll see when number two is unveiled on this list. Bale's always interesting to watch on screen, and the pale blue eye is no exception. Let's go to IMDb for a synopsis. A world-weary detective, and that's Bale, is hired to investigate the murder of a West Point cadet. Stymied by the cadet's code of silence, he enlists one of their own to help unravel the case. A young man the world would come to know as Edgar Allan Poe. So, this is a uh, Bale and a Poe story, Poe-related story, that takes place at West Point, so I'm in. Uh, my dad worked at West Point for over 25 years. I grew up about 12 miles from the campus, so that was an extra added attraction for me. This is very entertaining, mystery thriller. That will impress even the non-Poe geeks, okay? Uh, number two on the list, I promised you more Bale. Here it is from 2022, Amsterdam. So, Christian Bale joins up with Margot Robbie and John David Washington as three friends who uh, witness a murder and then get framed for it. This mystery comedy takes place in the 30s and boasts an impressive supporting cast, including Anna Taylor-Joy, Chris Rock, Michael Shannon, Mike Myers, Timothy Oliphant, Rami Malek, and Robert De Niro. Even Taylor Swift joins this fun. Um, Amsterdam was a flop at the box office, and critics gave it lukewarm reviews, 
but I rarely pay attention to that nonsense. As I've said many times, this is all of this is totally subjective. If you like it, you like it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. It doesn't matter if anyone else does. You matter, and that's it. When it comes to movies, it's only you that matters, and that's just the way it goes. And let's see what topped the list for January uh, here at Cinema Wellman. It's from 2022, and it's titled The Menu. And with this one, I'm not sure where to begin. This horror thriller also has more than a pinch of comedy. It skewers the rich, it skewers the entitled, it skewers foodies, and it's deliciously nasty. IMDb tells us this. A young couple travels to a remote island to eat at an exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises. Uh, Anna Taylor-Joy is in this, and she's one of the very few people that you're rooting for among the snobbishly elite dinner guests. Her date's played by Nicholas Holt, and he's a smarmy scumbag, and that's putting it nicely. Ray Fiennes is the chef. He is outstanding. You never quite know exactly what's going on, and I love that sometimes in movies, but you're riveted to the screen as you watch things unfold and try to put the pieces together. Um, I never want to spoil anything with these types of films, so I'll just tell you one more thing. Other than the, end, other than the ending, which was so tasty, <laughs> my favorite part was what I called the bread scene. It's so funny, and it's so true when it comes to fine dining. Um, I really enjoyed this, and I plan on re-watching it soon. Bon appetit, and as my friend would say, chef's kiss. Um, so, that's it. That's a wrap for January. That's the best I had for you. That's the worst I had for you. Um, as always, if you're interested, the platforms are on the blog. That's cinemawellman.com. Um, and I'll be back next week for the first in the in a series of City Spotlight pieces. And our first cinematic stop will be the great city of San Francisco. And I hope you will enjoy join me for that. Uh, listen to Silma Wenlin. You're either listening uh, on Spotify or you're watching it on YouTube, and I really appreciate that. Don't forget to follow us on uh, on the Twitter and the Instagram, and uh, and I'll see you in San Francisco next week. Until then, take care.